Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Right now we are in a series titled For the Love of Transitions. We wanted to bring this topic to the forefront of our shared discussions for a few reasons. Number one, um, every single day we are transforming and learning and moving forward. And that will always be the case. Nothing is static. Um, Our circumstances change. Our relationships change. We change. Um, This is good, not bad. And two, transitioning and moving through life allows us the, the time and the understanding to grow into who we've always wanted to be right into who we really even are in our core. Um, And so I approach this idea of transition in from a positive angle with great hope embedded inside of it with um, expectation, with possibility. Um, So I don't see this as life was a bummer and how do we just pick up the pieces? Because I could do that too. I have access to that angle personally, Um, but rather what can we do? What's possible now? Um, So I am really excited about today's episode. Really thrilled that you are here. Just don't miss any of this episode today because one thing that a lot of us are transitioning inside of right now by either choice or by kind of what was forced upon us this last calendar year is, is sort of financial upheaval, right? Our finances. Um, A lot of us had to take a look and go, where am I? Am I out of control here? Um, Am I driving this ship? Am I, is the tail wagging the dog? Do we have to make some renovations? Um, What does this look like moving forward? A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people downsized in their jobs because you had to stay home and manage kids. Um, A lot of industries were hit really, really hard. And then for some of us, like me, I went through a divorce. And so all of a sudden I am in charge of finances in which I have never played a role. Never. I'm 46 years old. Never. Um, I didn't... Um, know what I made. I didn't know what our bills were. I didn't know if we had a budget. I didn't know if we were saving. I didn't know anything. And um, I told Tiffany this, who I'll introduce to you in just a second, but um, the way that I, the outward facing way that I couched this was like a little, like a little cutesy, wootsy, shoulder shrug, like helpless lady. I don't know what I make guys. Like I hope nothing ever happens to Brandon. Cause I don't know how the electricity gets paid. Well, something did happen. And all of a sudden I needed to know how that electricity got paid. And all of a sudden I did need to know how much money I make. And all of a sudden I did need to say, wow, the only person I can count on for the rest of my life is me. And so that includes financial stability. And so for those of you who have been with me for the last last year, you've watched me do this in real time in the public eye. When I tell you that the first time I ever sat down in my accountant's office, who I'd never met with, and literally I had to say, what are our accounts? How, How many accounts do we have? Like what banks are they at? What, how much money's in there? I mean, I was at ground zero guys. And um, the, the work of just inching through account by account, by bill by bill was the work of my adult life. And I figured it all out. I, people taught me, they helped me, they advised me. I asked 1 million questions. I, I just decided right up front, I will ask any question I don't understand because it's already embarrassing to be a 46 year old who has no idea how much money she makes, who has let her handed over her financial independence 
on purpose to great detriment, right? That's already embarrassing. And I'm like, you know what? This is a time to be humble. I will ask questions. I don't care how silly they are, how elementary they sound. And I did. And I used anybody who would help me. I worked with my bankers. They work for free. Um, And they're surprisingly helpful. This is what they do. I worked with my accountant. Um, I worked with a bookkeeper. I worked with a financial planner. There's a bunch of stuff online. Um, I worked with my mortgage lender. I'm not paying them. They work at the mortgage company. I worked with everybody. And I slashed and I cut and I reduced and I canceled subscriptions and I trimmed and trimmed and trimmed and trimmed and, um, and then started working through the steps of like, what's one level deeper than just a budget? <laughs> like what's past? This is what I make. This is what I spend. This is what's left. And I moved into savings and I moved into investments and I moved into estate planning and I discovered that I was pretty wildly under insured, underinsured. Um, that if I'm the only person, if I don't have a partner and something goes down with this ship, I wasn't insured enough to manage my life. Um, and I just want to tell you that 10 months later, I am sitting in such a different place. And it's not as hard as you think. It's time consuming, especially up front. You got to front load a lot of hours. Um, but this is possible. This is so possible. I remember when the day that I closed on our, I refinanced my house because um, I was asking questions. What's the thing to do? What, who couldn't you, what's the next thing I should do? And my um, financial planner was like, interest rates are at an all time low. You are already living under your means. Um, in the house that you live in, um, you have the potential to really drop this down. And I refinanced my own house in my own name for 2.1%. And I remember closing on that, just thinking, I did, I did it. Like I did this for about the same mortgage. I'm going to pay off my house 15 years earlier. It's just all possible. And I'm just a person. I am not a math person. I, I am not like an economist. I'm, this isn't natural to me. Um, I don't have a, a head for numbers or budgets. Or I just want you to know I'm a word person for crying out loud. And yet, if I can figure it out, so can you. Not only so can you, so should you. I don't care if you're single like me, newly, um, or if you're hap, hap, happily married, you should still know this. You should still be an active partner in the management and the planning of your financial stability, of ultimately your financial flourishing. Um, My guest today is just pretty incredible. Like, this is going to be a great one stop shop for you if you're like, I don't know where to start. Tiffany Aliche, AKA the Budgetista. She co-hosts the award-winning Brown Ambition podcast. She appears as a financial expert on The Real. She runs an online school called the Live Richer Academy, where she has taught tens of thousands of women how to create and implement and automate their financial plans. She has been featured in a slew of publications, including the Wall Street Journal and Black Enterprise and Reader's Digest. It goes on and on and on. Her series of recorded financial tips created for CNBC reaches 80 million unique viewers a month. She's really, really smart and thoughtful in the financial space, but she had to learn it the hard way. Wait till you hear her story. And her work to teach women has been a real inspiration for me. Um, she, I love Tiffany because she's trustworthy. She learned this the hard way. She, she bootstrapped this. Um, she learned this by being in the hole and digging out. Um, she is you can trust her. She's a trustworthy advisor and accessible. And um, I found everything she said easy to grab onto. She's a good teacher, a really good guide. If you feel like you are just in the quagmire of question marks around this conversation, this is your leader. This is your leader. I am so pleased to share my conversation with the absolutely wonderfully smart, talented, and charming Tiffany Aliche. All right. Super happy to meet you, Tiffany. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. Thank you for having me, Jen. I'm excited. 
You look awesome this morning. Thank you. <laughs> I just do want YouTube watchers to know this is the crack of the morning, you guys. So <laughs> yeah. if we have on makeup, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you put on a real sweater and I, I commend you. I have on my blondie t-shirt. <laughs> no, I like blondie, so <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> Call me. Um, so, okay, Tiffany, I've already filled in my listeners a little bit about um, who you are, some of your incredible credentials, of course. Um, but can you take a, just a few moments to share kind of from a high level, uh, a little bit about what you do uh, and your current work? I am a financial educator. I help, especially women, although we don't turn anyone away, I help them to learn how to master their money and mm-hmm. achieve what I like to call financial wholeness, which mm-hmm. is when like your financial fund- fundamentals, which are these 10 core aspects of your money come together to create a foundation. So think about like, I used to be a preschool teacher before I was the budgetista. So think mm-hmm. about me, like I'm like your financial preschool teacher. I'm here to give you the fundamentals so you can move on to the rest of your financial life. Oh my gosh. Let me tell you why I love that so much because <laughs> we'll get to it. I'm going to save it for a minute, but I am newly in charge of my financial life by myself after an okay. um, unexpected divorce last okay. summer. Uh, having never done my own financials ever. Mm. Um, and so I, when I sat down with my financial planner okay, uh, with like, this is me coming in with papers, like putting them on him. Like, I don't know what any of this is. I don't know. Can you help me? I told him, please talk to me. Like I'm a kindergartner. Yes. That's what I, I needed. Exactly what you just said. Talk to me in simple terms. Assume I don't know what you mean. Mm -hmm. Assume I don't know what the words are and explain to me. So I really appreciate your approach toward this because weirdly and really for no good reason, financial stability and wholeness, as you say, which is such a good word, it can be intimidating for women. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Because we're just not taught it. We're taught that it's a man's job and role. Yeah. We're taught that, you know, like math and science, that's for boys. Yeah, you're right. You know, and then. You know, thankfully, some of that is changing somewhat, but it's really like in general, we're not we're not learning financial education in school, but especially for girls and women, we're really just kind of taught that your dad will take care of it. And then maybe your brother, if you have one. And then if you get married, your husband will. And it's like, no, when will you step in? And I'm fortunate, Jen, in that. I think that probably would have happened for me. But my dad had not one, not two, but five girls. (laughs) God bless him. God yes, bless I mean. him, keep him. <laughs> and so I remember, like, obviously my mother was like, no more boys are not coming because clearly that's what they were trying for. Totally. You know, and, but I remember him distinctly saying, well, I'm not getting my son. So I'm going to teach you guys how to manage your money because wow. he was a CFO and an accountant. Mm-hmm. And it was his thought process that I'm going to look after you and then I'll have a son and then he'll make sure you're fine and then you'll get married. Sure. But I was just like, thankfully that didn't happen. So yeah. he really had to say, well, I'm going to have to teach you how to look after yourselves. And, and he did. And so now I've been teaching other women. Oh, that's so incredible. Yeah. I have five kids. Okay. And, yeah. And um, there were somewhere between upper teenage and young adult. So mm-hmm. we're in the launching phase of life. And, you know, my young adults are just saying, I'll tell you what I wish out of school. I wish that I didn't spend so much time on the periodic table, which I'm not going to remember. I wish somebody would have taught me how to do a budget. I wish somebody would have taught me what investing means Mm -hmm. and how does that work? I think you're right. I think we have a real financial deficiency period. I mean, even Mm -hmm. those, even the boys Mm -hmm. um, are kind of thrown in the deep end, like sink or swim fellas. This is apparently your job. Yes. (laughs) Um, Even they haven't really been well-trained. So I love hearing you talk about your family. Was it your dad? Was your was your inspiration rooted in kind of his influence in your life? What is it that made you want to empower women to be in control of their finances? Was there a point in your own life with financial turmoil or whatever? Um, what what was the impetus for you saying I, I'm, I was teaching preschool mm-hmm. and now I'm going to do this? 
Well, yeah. So growing up, yes, we learned at home regularly. My dad was like the academic, right? Like, come sit down and I'll show you how I do my family's budget. But my mom, she was real life application. Like, mm. let's go food shopping. And this is why we get meat from the butcher and bread from the bakery. Mm. And this is why we freeze some things because there's five of you, aka seven of us. So we got to see like what real life looked like, you know? Um, but what happened was um, I was basically financially perfect until mid 20s because mm. I was still just doing what my parents told me, especially my dad. Mm. Like he said, pay off your credit card every month and paid it off every month. Yeah. You know, he said, don't open up another credit card. I didn't. But usually like around, like once you, once you start to get to your twenties, you start feeling like I'm an adult. I don't need to listen to anybody. I'm mm. fully grown. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I decided to just blow up my financial life. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> you know, so I, I bought a condo, which in itself is not bad. And yeah, I could afford that mortgage. Um, then I went back to get my master's in education. So it's $220,000 for the condo, $52,000 for this master. Yeah. Even that, it's like, oh, okay, you know, these are choices. Um, then I, a friend of mine who I thought was wealthy because he had nice mm-hmm. stuff. Sure. I asked him to teach me how to invest because why would I ask my parents or my father in particular who, that's what he did for a living. Yeah. You know, I'm going to ask my pseudo rich friend. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And so he proceeded to get me involved in a scheme that left me $35,000 in credit card debt. Oh my gosh. Yes, I know. And I did not <sighs> want to tell, like, especially my father, like, oh my gosh, because here I thought, you know, I'm not asking for more advice from him. Yeah. And I was trying to figure my way out of it. Um, and then the recession happened, the great recession. Yeah. Yeah. And I lost my job. So I've got, man, you know, almost $300,000 in debt and no job. I ended up having to move back home at 29. Yeah. You know, which was not fun. I didn't even tell my father. I just started to bring like a lamp home. <laughs> and then, then but, you know, with my mattress, he's like, are you, are you back home? Of course, you know, you tell your mom everything. So I told my mom, uh, but I didn't want to tell him. That's so like, funny. He's, he's going to be so mad at me. He's going to, you know, it's so, all. He was like, wait, are you, uh, do you live here now? Right. Do you live here now? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so funny. You know, and, um, but it was such a humbling time because yeah. like my sister at the time, I think I want to say that maybe she was a, a, um, a senior in high school. So she was still home and she had like my, my like super cool, like a uh, pad in the basement. So like my dad had turned it into like, it had a bathroom and a mini kitchen. And, and she was like, oh yeah, you can't have this back. This is where I live now. <laughs> totally. I <laughs> so know I was, it. Right. I was back in my middle school bedroom. So here I was 29 going on 30 Yeah, in my middle school bedroom. And I remember like literally on my 30th birthday, laying in the bed, crying, like letting tears, silently crying, letting tears fall down the sides of my face. Because I thought to myself, mm. I had more money the last time I slept in this bed. Maybe I would say like, I don't know, 14 or 13 mm. when I used to babysit and, you know, house it. And I had like maybe a few thousand dollars in my bank account saved up. I had more money then than I do now at age 30. And I just remember being like, it was just a humbling time. And I promised myself if I dug my way out Mm. that, um, well, really what happened was it was because it was the great recession. So many of my friends were in similar situations. Yeah. And so I promised if I dug my way out, I was going to help them too. And so the budget Mm. was born. Mm -hmm. What'd you do? I mean, where'd you start? That's a big mountain. It is. And honestly, it started with, it's not, it actually didn't start with external, like financial stuff. It started with my best friend calling me being like, where the hell you been? You don't pick mm. up your phone. You don't hang out. Cause I was so ashamed. I hid myself from everything. Totally. So she was like, I told her, I was like, Linda, I got all this money. She was like, you mean like everybody else? Mm. She's like, girl, I'm calling you from my mother's couch. Right. As we speak. Mm. <laughs> and we both Just like normalized laughing. it for you. Yes. Yeah. And she gave me the permission I needed to forgive myself. I didn't realize I was angry uh, at myself. Mm, yeah. But I was like, you grew up in this household where you could have easily asked for help and you refused. So mm. I was angry at myself. So I was punishing myself internally. Yeah. You know, and once Linda made me realize I wasn't the only one, I was able to forgive myself and release some of that shame. Mm. Shame is really, really, really detrimental. Totally. It'll just keep you paralyzed, right? Mm-hmm. Just absolutely frozen, unable to move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started with really just a budget. I was like, okay, let me list everything I owe yeah, and what my expenses are and like what I have coming in, which was really just unemployment. Yeah. You know, so, so it's just the basic just, in just out. Basic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was it. And I was like, okay, everyone is not going to get some of this out because it's just not enough. Yeah. 
So I had to decide and prioritize, okay, who can I afford to pay and who can I, who do I have to call and say, I don't have it right now. Mm. Is there some sort of program or plan? Mm -hmm. Some people said, okay, we can work something out. And some people were like, we don't care. Give us our money either way. And I had to learn too. Like, for example, my mortgage, there's no way I could afford my, I was making like, my mortgage was 1660. And I want to say unemployment was maybe like 2200. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I called my mortgage company and they were like, yeah, we don't care. (laughs) Totally. And they called me every single day. Like I used to literally, my hands were shaking, my phone rang. Gosh. And then until I realized that there's something called a cease and desist letter. So Mm -hmm. I called a friend of mine, Michaela, who was an attorney. And I was like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, Like the mortgage company is calling me, but I just don't have it. I tried to call them, work something out. And she said, well, you want them to contact you, but you have the choice of how to do so. Tiffany, go to Staples with 75 cents and print out a cease and desist letter. Put like, please don't call me at these numbers anymore, but you can email me and you can mail me here. Oh, and she was like, fax it because it's faster. And there's a return receipt when you fax instantly. I didn't know and that. She was right. Yeah. Within, I would say within 24 hours, those phone calls stopped. Wow. Yes. And it gave me, because by law, you can tell your debt collectors how to contact you. Okay. Yeah. So that helped a lot because it gave me some breathing room. Like now yeah. I know my phone is ringing. It's not the debt collectors. Totally. So that's yeah. how I started was like creating this budget, stopping the phone from ringing. And then, mm-hmm. then I was able to calm down and say, okay, so how can I make additional income? Yeah. And so I started to babysit again. I started yeah. tutoring. Mm-hmm. I'm also getting like some unemployment on the side. Um, and they had not foreclosed on my house yet. Mm-hmm. So I rented it out. Sure. And, and even though they weren't paying the full mortgage and the mortgage company would not take partial payment. So I mm. think I was able to rent it for 1200, even yeah. though my mortgage was 1660. So I told the mortgage company, will you take 1200? They said, no. I mm. said, well, I'll take 1200. <laughs> so, <Totally. laughs> so I used that 1200 to help me pay the rest of my bills. Yeah. And so, and then I did that until they foreclosed on the house. So it wasn't pretty. Yeah. It was just like, you know, a mosh posh of I was doing something, but something that really helped me, Jen, is that as I was doing it, my friends would say, well, what are you doing? Can you show me? And I'm like, well, it's not perfect. And they're like, yeah. well, it's better than what I'm doing. Yeah. So as I learned a thing, I showed them that thing. Hmm. And you did it. How long did it take you to sort of dig out? A long time. So 29 is when everything fell apart. And I would say I started to see a little light at the end of the tunnel at 33 going on 34. So yeah. if you're listening, yep. you're like, it's been six months and I'm still, I'm like, uh, so keep one, going. What? Because it was like a year on, in my, my middle school bed hmm. and I spent a year on my sister's couch because I yep. just could not live with my parents anymore. <laughs> right. right. It had occurred to you, my dad, because my daddy was always strict <laughs> with five girls. I think that every dad yeah. is always strict. And I was uh, like, but daddy, I'm 29. He's like, you're also home. <laughs> Do you have a watch? (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, 30 years old. I was like, I can't stay here. Right. Okay. Yeah. My sister was untenable. Yeah. So she, which which is kind of good sometimes because I think I would have gotten very comfortable. Sure. Of course. So I know my dad was like, I love you, but you're messing up my group over here. (laughs) Um, So I stayed with my sister on her couch for a year. Yeah. Until she got tired of me because she was a one, it was a one bedroom. Sure. So she was like, I love you as well. You're not going to be homeless because you could always move back home with daddy and mommy. I was like, I don't want to move back home. So a friend of yeah. mine was like, I'm renting a room. It's really beautiful brownstone downtown where we live. Mm. And each room is $500. Okay. And so imagine going from owning your own condo yeah. to living in a room. But yep. honestly, I was like, at least I have my own autonomy. Mm. And she just, she didn't just ask me, she asked other, other of our girlfriends. So it was like five of us. It was like a sorority house, <laughs> yeah. you know, five of us renting a room. We were all in our thirties because mm. um, the recession had wiped everyone out. Sure. Five of us living in this house, we each had a room and we would share duties in the kitchen, clean up together. And honestly, it was some of the best times mm. in my life because it normalized. I'm not the only one struggling. Yeah. And if I had questions about how to do something, there was a house full of like amazing women who are my friends I could lean into. Hmm. If they had questions. They were kind of like my first guinea pig with the budget Nista. Yeah. Um, and so I lived there for about two, I think I'll go on three years. And as I started to build the budget Nista, it was really from that platform. Hmm. And then I was able to make enough money. I would say by 33, I replaced my preschool teacher income, which wasn't a ton of money, but it was enough. 
Yeah. You know, and then by 34, the business really started to take off. And yeah. maybe I made my first six figures, I think, in yeah. 34. Then 35, it grew and grew and grew because yeah. life is cumulative. Uh-huh. So in the beginning, it seems like not much is happening. Like a mm-hmm. seed is in the ground and it's like nothing's happening. You're mm-hmm. watering it. You're making totally. sunshine. And what happened was really at 33, I saw the first little yeah. piece of green poking out. And then it starts to seem like it grows quickly, but yeah. it's always been growing. It was just growing underground. I think we can all relate to feeling overwhelmed, overwhelmed by schedules, by situations, by work stuff, by stress, so much. And health and wellness can often be firmly planted in that overwhelming category. I know that's because there's just so darn much information out there. Like, where do you even start? It's a lot to navigate, especially when you don't have a lot of time. This is why I started using Noom and I've never looked back. Noom makes it easy to take wellness one step at a time to build better lifestyle habits, like in our food choices and daily movement. So it's effective no matter what your wellness goals are, but it never feels overwhelming. When I'm intentionally using Noom, I find that I have more energy and I show up better for my family and friends. There's another great thing about Noom too. They are so supportive in this whole process. They use a psychology-based approach to help shift mindset, to help us choose the things that will make a positive impact in our lives. And Noom customizes a program for you based on your personal goals. It fits into your life on your terms. And get this, 80% of Noom users finish the program and over 60% have stuck with their goals for at least a year. Those are some impressive stats. So start building better habits for healthier long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash for the love. That's N O O M dot com slash for the love sisters you know me i am not a beauty expert i do what i can but i'm also fortunate to have friends who show me the way tell me what products to use what to do what it all means we all need friends like this they're how i originally found out about function of beauty and i'll tell you they did not steer me wrong here Function of beauty is the definition of hair goals that we all want. So, friends who are listening, I'm passing along this hair secret to you. What's really cool about Function of Beauty is this. It's all personalized and customized to you. You take a fun, quick quiz, and then products are developed for you based on precise formulations for your own hair. My unique formula was based on my hair profile, which is wavy and medium, and my goals to hydrate, color protect, get rid of frizz, and add shine and volume. And of course, I asked for mine in a lavender fragrance. And because our hair goals often change from you know season to season, you can always change your custom formulas. So here's how to get started. Take the quiz, get your results, and then the Function of Beauty team will take it from there. They'll determine the perfect blend of ingredients before bottling your special formula and delivering it right to you. Every ingredient Function of Beauty uses is vegan and cruelty-free, and they never use sulfates or parabens. And get this, there are more than 54 trillion possible formulations. Crazy, right? Function of Beauty also offers completely personalized formulas for body and skin care too. So you can customize your beauty routine from hair to toe. Never buy off the shelf just to be disappointed ever again. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash for the love to take your quiz and save 20% on your first order. That applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products. So go to functionofbeauty.com slash for the love to let them know we sent you. And to get 20% off your order, that's functionofbeauty.com slash for the love. I love that metaphor. That's exactly how my career was too. Um, The first, hell, five to seven years felt invisible. It was just underground. 
just yes. underground. It was growing. Yeah. It was sprouting tiny little mm-hmm. sprouts under there, but it hadn't just popped through yet. I really love that. And I appreciate you sharing your story because um, financial recovery yeah, and then ultimately growth can be st- as you mentioned earlier, so shame-based, yes. which it shouldn't be, but I appreciate you saying it can also be a sloppy, hot mess and take a long time. <laughs> like, yes. thanks for saying that because it's true. Yeah, It's true. Like I know a lot of people listening around are kind of in that claw. They're in that mm-hmm. like claw yes. up the mountain. Yep. And it's nice to hear somebody else say, just keep going, yes. like keep going. Yep. So I, I want to talk to you about some of the people I'm assuming listening What would you say, you know, of course this year, I mean, we've just been through it, right? Mm -hmm. So what would you say to, to those of us who are um, reevaluating maybe after we've been hit by a financial tsunami this year, Mm -hmm. um, which was, you know, ubiquitous everywhere. So many industries just hurt so deeply. Um, So, you know, maybe there was a job loss or Mm -hmm. um, uh, unexpected expenses. A lot of parents had to toggle their work to stay home and homeschool. Mm -hmm. Um, So two things to talk about here that I'm going to ask you. Number one, how do people combat the, just the sheer fear, like the terror Mm -hmm. of not being able to pay our bills or provide for those we love? That financial fear is acute. And then secondly, you probably have a million things to reach for, but what's the first thing you would suggest we can do that sort of begins to give us the feeling like you can rebuild. There mm-hmm. is hope that here is a baby step to begin to walk you mm-hmm. into recovery and mm-hmm. ultimately flourishing. So I would say first to, to that, that acute fear of like, what are we going to eat? So yeah. one of the things that I wish I would have done sooner is I wish I would have prioritized my health and safety first. Uh, because what uh, happened was Jen is like, I was like, okay, for the first year or two, I was trying to maintain my current lifestyle. It wasn't that I was like going out or anything like that, but meaning like paying my mortgage, paying for things that although were important, they didn't necessarily um, uh, generate my health and safety um, mm. expenses. You know, because the truth is, if I didn't pay my mortgage, I wasn't going to be homeless. I was fortunate because I couldn't move back home. Yeah. You know, so so because I maintained for so long, so I pulled money out of my retirement account. I used all of my savings. And had I just said, you know what, Tiffany, this thing hit. What are your health and safety? But what must you pay to maintain hmm. health and safety? Mm-hmm. Like I have asthma. So I'm like, okay, you know, you need your asthma medica- medication. Okay. You like, okay. So your, your mortgage is one of your most expensive bills. And although it'll be tragic for you not to pay it, it won't relate. It won't, it won't, it won't keep, it won't make you unhealthy or unsafe hmm. because you do have a safe place to stay. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So that way the money I would have had would have lasted me longer. Mm. And so that's what I would say. And I give people that permission because I wish someone would have given me that permission to say, it's okay to say everyone's not getting paid right now. Hmm. Only the things that are going to help me maintain a healthy and safe environment for myself and my family. Yeah. Because if, if you use up all your money prematurely, then there's nothing left over for even health and safety later. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It doesn't mean you won't get back to it. Now, will your credit score take? Yes. Hmm. You know, will debt collectors be like, oh, yes, but that's why you have your cease and desist letter, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and the thing is, you don't just stop paying, you let them know. And the, the, the good thing is, is that because this is a collective experience we're all experiencing, there are way more hardship programs. Oh, right. You know? Totally mm-hmm. true. Yeah. So you have a lot of people who actually will say, we know. So this is what we're able to do. Not everyone yeah. will say that, but a lot more uh, creditors and, and debt collectors are, are, you know, are more understanding. Yeah. So. That's what I would say is, and, and don't be afraid to ask for help. I don't care if that's like hmm. food pantry near you, hmm. reach out to family and friends. If you're able, um, the sooner you ask for help, yeah. the, the better, you know, um, and not just that, but asking what are other people doing? Because sometimes <laughs> there's programs that you don't know that you might, uh, you might qualify for, you know? So I started, I have a Facebook group called dream catchers live richer with the budget Nista. It's like 500,000 mostly women, Hmm. although we do have some men in there strong. And so I encourage people there and they do 24 hours a day to ask for help. Hmm. You know, like, does anybody know a program in Texas who does X, Y, Z? Yes, I do. Girl, I live in Texas. I, you know, there's um, a program that you can qualify for that, you know, will send you money for food during pandemic and quarantine, you know? Yeah. And so I would say that health and safety first, first ask for help. And, and one of the best ways to shed shame 
is um, finding um, an accountability partner that to your second question, kind of like, mm. what's the first thing you should do Yeah, is you, you like, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to shed shame on your own. Mm. So finding someone that you could work through this journey with, whether it could be a significant other, it could be a, um, a sibling, it could yeah. be a parent, it could be your work bestie, your work husband, you know what I mean? Someone who like you're Linda. Yeah. Who is going to yeah. be like, oh, girl, I'm on my mother's couch. I'm like, oh, yes. you too? Okay, good. You know? Yes, yes. So that even before you do any of the financial things, hmm. like finding that a safe, solid place, they're not there to be a financial expert. They're there to be your, to hold you accountable, to encourage you, to normalize the process hmm. and to help you shed that shame. You know, so to, together you can work through it because Linda and I would then call each other every week. Like, okay, girl, I made a list of all of my expenses. Nice. All these can't get paid. Did you do it? Yes, I did. Well, uh, who are you going to pay? Well, I'm not paying this person, this person. Yeah. Okay. You know, or sometimes I remember I would get like the pink and red envelopes in the mail and I'd be scared to open them. Yeah. And I'm like, Linda, what are you doing this weekend? She's like, nothing. I'm like, you want to open some envelopes for me? <laughs> totally. So literally I used to, Linda would like, I would open hers and she would open mine. And I would like with eyes closed, like, what does it say? Like, it says final notice. Yeah, totally. (laughs) So, but do you see how that's good? You know, because because here's the thing about money. Money is truly all about mindset. Because anyone could teach you how to budget and save. These things can be automated, you know. But right without the mindset shift, you will likely be right back where you started. Hmm. You know, or even if you do fix it, you will fix it and live in terror. Like I had uh, post-traumatic stress. Yeah. I didn't even recognize that I did. Yeah. Even when the business was doing good, totally. I had plenty of money. I, when I tell you I saved every penny, Jen, my accountant was like, Tiffany, are you, are you spending any money? I'm like, um, yeah. yeah. He's like, you're not. Yeah. Because Tiffany, like almost all that you've made is still here. Yeah. I was so terrified of losing everything again that I was not living, Mm. you know? And so Mm. that's why that mindset component is so critically important because, you know, you want to, you want to feel free once you free yourself from that financial burden. So that's what I would say uh, to, to unlock that, that terror, Mm. but also first steps, financial and, and accountability partner. And just listing where you are on paper. This yes. is what we owe every month. This yes. is who we currently owe. So you can start to create a plan. And honestly, that's why I wrote my book, the um, Get Good With Money, my yeah. new book. Because I knew that so many people don't have a step-by-step-by-step plan. Yeah. And there, it's like, it's unique because I wrote it during 2020. So although it's a step-by-step guide, it's literally called Get Good With Money, 10 Simple Steps to Living Financially Whole or to Becoming Financially Whole. But in my mind, I thought to myself, so many people are going to need to rebuild and they don't have a guide or a tool. That's right. You know, so it works you through, here's the mindset stuff. We start with that first. And yeah. then literally step one is, let me show you how to budget. Okay. Yes. Then step two, let me show you how to save. Got you. Mm. Then step three, then it's, it's debt, then yeah. credit. Then learning how to earn, because you have to learn how to earn outside of your normal job. Even if you don't Mm. tap into a side hustle, everyone should know how to activate additional income when they need to. Mm. I think think that that's what the last couple of years have taught us, right? Totally. Absolutely. Right. So six is investing. You have to learn how to invest because you have to grow your money. You're not going to save and and, um, budget your way to wealth. Yeah. Then seven is, um, is your insurance. It's super inc- mm. incredibly important. I was underinsured and did not Me know, too. you know, mm-hmm. because you like, you know, you grow up per- like professionally and personally, and you have the insurance of your 27 year old self, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, then there's net worth because, yeah. um, eight is net worth because, you know, learning how to own your assets more than you owe your liabilities. That's really going to put you in a healthy, strong financial position. Hmm. Nine is, is um, pro- your professional money team. Everyone mm. needs at least somebody. So it's your accountability partner, yeah. but also do you need an accountant? Yep. Do you need a certified financial planner? Do you need an attorney? Yeah. You know, do you need an estate plan lawyer? And and 10 is estate planning. Yeah. So many of us say, I don't need an estate plan, but yep. like COVID has taught us that life is not guaranteed. A hundred percent. You know, and if you have children, you a hundred thousand yes. percent. If you have minor children need an yep. estate plan, if you don't have minor children, like an estate plan. So say for example, you're 25 and you're like, I don't have an estate. Do you have a bank account? That's right. 
because you can put your mom as your beneficiary on your bank yep. account. That's, That's right. State plan for us at 25. Yeah. You know, do you have a retirement account at work that they gave you? Yeah. You put your sister down as your beneficiary and you're totally. like, that's your estate plan. So those 10 steps to financial wholeness, like that is the guide. That is, that is what I had to rework for myself. And that is the guide that I created for my friends that I were helping mm. that I was helping. And then friends of friends and then friends of friends. So those are really the steps to rebuilding Man. and maintaining a strong financial life. I've done all of those steps in the last 10 months. Mm-hmm. And it, at when you hear it from when you front load it all, it's so overwhelming. Yes. That's it's so many things, um, especially for the majority of people who aren't managing this. They're not, you know, the stats tell us not a lot of people have savings. Mm-hmm. Um, not people have done estate planning. I mean, I I was all of a sudden like, I am a single mom of five kids, and I do not have beneficiaries named. Mm-hmm. You know, like I have a life insurance policy. Where's it going? Yeah, uh, I was also underinsured. Um, my I appreciate you talking about the financial team because I've talked about that a lot um, in the last few months online. A lot of people, I think, find themselves in a place like I was where either they've, they're have they divorced, mm-hmm. um, but even the marrieds who just have a financial division of labor in which they have absolutely relegated all yes. financial decisions to their partner, they need to listen up here because... Yep everyone needs to be financially capable. We need to be in front of our own. We need to be driving our own ship. Yeah. And and a very minimum, be a contributing partner and decision maker Mm -hmm. to our financial health, single or married. Mm -hmm. Um, So how would you, how do you help people that are, let's just say, to just put you know, a fine point on it, moving from a a season of shared finances with a partner Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to living and managing their finances with one income. And that Mm -hmm. could be either through divorce or through job loss, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially if one partner was the primary breadwinner Um, or in the other case, maybe the, one of the partners never even did money. They're like, what's Mm -hmm. money? What's my electric bill? Mm -hmm. What's, I don't know what to do. Um, how do you talk to that person who's in this transition of, whoop, I'm in charge. Well, first things first, like before you get into like the deeper aspects, it's like, all right, we just need you to get you floating. You know, like whenever you like, let's, let's just pretend like you're learning to swim and that's, that's money management. One of the first things you learn, you know, if you learn to swim as a kid is they teach you how to float Hmm. because they're like, if all else fails, sis, get on your back and just, (laughs) just float. I'm not going to teach you the butterfly and all that stuff. That's good. You know? And so I want you to be like, okay, what does floating look like in this transition? So floating is going to look like at the very least, I need to know what are my bills Hmm. and how do they get paid? Yeah, that, that's a beast when it's just out here in the world, mm-hmm. even writing when I, the first time I wrote that down, it was with a pen mm-hmm. and a notebook, like as yep. 1984 called, yes. I love and I'm that. just <laughs> sketching it out. Like, mm-hmm. and I, I honestly encourage that. So yeah. literally that's, it's just as simple as that. Like, yeah. Okay. Bills are going to come due tomorrow, no matter what's happening in my yep. life. Who do I owe? Mm-hmm. You know, like, okay, I know there's a mortgage somehow that has to be paid or, or rent. I know we have electric and water. Is, do we pay garbage people? Yeah. You know, like, so literally making that list, you know, who do I have to pay, especially like those monthly things and, and how do I pay them and how much is it just so you can get a gauge of like where you are. Yeah. Now it doesn't guarantee that you'll have enough, but at least you'll know, you know, like instantly that should be one of the first things that you do. And like I said, I prefer the, the notebook and, and, and pen because it gets real when mm. you do it that way, you know, later on you can move it to an Excel spreadsheet or whatever yeah. you want to, but you want to sit down to do that because you also want to ask yourself, what things can I cut off automatically? Do we need Disney plus Hulu? Totally. Oh man, I canceled a million things. Yes. So when you have that list, you're like, okay, there's not even enough for the things I have to pay. I'm certainly not going to continue to pay the things that are optional, at least for now, because those subscriptions can always be brought late, be brought back later if you need them. Right. So we're slashing everything, you know? And if you have um, children, it's, oh, I think it's important to bring them in on the conversation. Good. Yeah, mm-hmm. I really do because mm-hmm. transparency, because here's the thing about kids. They know something's wrong either way. Yeah. 
You not saying anything does not shield them from like totally. something's wrong. Mom's crying. I could tell. Yeah. Look at her eyes. She's yeah. not as happy. What's going on? Yeah. So it's like, okay, here's the new, here's where we are now. So my parents are really good at doing this, not from a place of fear, mm. you know, like, so um, I'll give an example. My mom lost her job when I was like in high school, maybe middle school. And it was right before Christmas. And basically they had to tell us there was not going to be any Christmas presents. So mm. how do you do that with like kids who are young and like, yeah. you know, and so I remember that my dad and mom sat us down and said, you know, as you know, mommy's hospital closed. She's a nurse. Mommy's hospital closed. And, um, but it's right before Christmas. But the good news is that Christmas, the most important part of Christmas is that we're together, mm. you know, so we're going to still be together, but um, presents will just have to come later. Yeah. And so I think it, they came in like February or March or whatever, but that conversation, and we still did have a good time. We made Christmas dinner together and we still hung out and our, and our family and friends still came over. Mm. And then we, um, we kept the tree up. And so we were able to put presents underneath it. And it was like, mm. well, all my friends were like already tired of their Christmas presents. I'm like, well, we, in February, we just had Christmas last weekend. So, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, but it's so it's great. It didn't feel, I mean, I knew something was kind of wrong, but I'm like, they don't seem to be acting like something is wrong. And, you know, like mm. it was more so we want your help. Or my dad would do this thing where he would say, you want to go on vacation? Um, here's our electric bill. Because if you have kids, you know, they leave every light on everywhere. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm like, just in case I decide to come back an hour or two later to this room. And so he would put the electric bill on the dining room table because our, our, um, our dining room was like central to our house. And he would put the month before and the current month and have the amount highlighted. Mm. And if it went down, he would put money in our vacation jar. Oh, you know? clever. So if it didn't go down, then it then he wouldn't. You know, we knew like, oh, man, you know, he's like, you know, we have to be down like three months in a row and four months in a row. If clever. We're gonna, you know, so even if it was like two or three dollars, I don't remember the amount, but it was just what he did was uh-huh. he made us part of the decision making fashion yeah. where it's like what I do helps to make the family better. Oh, that's you know? good. And so yeah. so it never felt like, oh, my God, the light goes too high. Instead, it was like, ooh, vacation is coming. Carol, yeah. turn off the light. I want to go to vacation. You know, that's <laughs> awesome. So, that's smart. Well, if you're doing that, so if, if it's mm-hmm. you're making this transition and it's not very fun but sitting the kids down or anybody who's part of the family and, and contributes or benefits from the finances. Like here's what's happening. You know, we have a little bit less temporarily, but it'll get yeah. better soon enough. You know, um, I don't know when, but in the meantime, we have to make some choices. You know, we have to get like, if the kids are old enough, you can actually share, we have to get the number down to here. Mm. So what are some things we can do to get the number down to here? Cause there might be some things that you think that they don't want to give up that they're like, we don't care about that. Yeah, that's true. That up, you know, or like, um, I know like, um, you, you might, they, your child might be like, yeah, let's have a garage sale. Oh, mm. that'll be fun. I can bring my stuff out, you know? And so like, um, um making sure that your family is a part of mm. the transition. So it's not so scary. And so when you say a thing, they're like, ah, got you. Yeah. That's why I can't get the Jordans. Like I normally get every year. Yeah. You know, right. because we just had this family conversation of we've got to get the, we have to get the numbers to a certain space temporarily. And then when things are going great, like, guess what? You know, um, like this is what happened with, I have a, a stepdaughter, Alyssa, she's 14 going on 45, but you know, right. <laughs> and so when I, when my, her, her, my, her father and I first started dating, hmm. I, like the, the budget it was not that it wasn't doing well, but it was so new. Yeah. And so I remember she would always see me like, like adding up the numbers and she would ask me what I was doing. And I would tell her like, well, I have to pay taxes. And I don't know where I'm going to buy my tax money. She asked yeah. me what taxes are for. And I told her, you know, the fact that you go to that school, tax yeah. money pays for that, the roads. And I said, well, one of the ways that I can save on taxes, if, if I have my receipt show that I use some of the money for my business yeah. on the business. Yeah. And here she was six years old. I remember yeah. she came home one day and she had a bag full of receipts. I'm like, what's this? She said, for you. So you can lower your taxes. But oh. obviously that way. I'm like, these are not my receipts, but, but that's cute. Come, yeah. You know? So she felt like, oh, I can participate. It's and great. Even now we're taking an investment class together. Nice. You know? Because she's like wanting to learn because she, she does little side jobs like after yeah. school and on the weekend. And so, so involving your family is a yeah. critical component to success. Cause I don't have to explain like 
things, uh, you know, like, I don't have to say like, well, this is why she knows. She's like, oh, no, no, I know. I know we talked about this is the budget for the month and we kind of went over last month. Yeah. So we really have to stick to it, but we can still have fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I list a bunch of free ways that we can, you know, free fun ways that we can do things yeah. this weekend. And so um, that's what I would just say. It, it's it's not, and it's okay for it to be hard. I think mm. we live in yeah. such a culture where we think that hard means um, bad. Mm-hmm. Yes. And mm-hmm. it doesn't. You know, it just means that this is where you currently are. Yeah. And, and, and the beauty of it is, is that it is preparing you for the greater later, Mm. you know, that like hard really helps to hone you Mm. to be able to maintain and keep the dreams that you seek, you know, because easy teaches you nothing. Like if everything is easy, 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 the moment you have, Mm. you know, like a little bit of hardship or like those kids that don't have to study in high school. Yeah. And they get great grades and then they get to college and it's different and they never learn to study. Yeah, that's right. So they're like, wait, what do I do? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know how to navigate in a space where I, where I had to learn to study. There's something to be said for earning mm-hmm. your stripes when it comes to your finances. Because once you like me now, you could take away everything. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I'll be back because mm-hmm. I've been here before. I, yeah. I can live in a room if I had to. Yeah. If I had to move that's back right. home, I could. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm tougher stuff now. Yeah. You know, and oh, so that's like, good. you know, it sucks in the beginning. You're like, I don't want to be tough or stuff, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. anyway, But I'm sure now, Jen, that you're like, you know what? At the end of this, yeah. no one will be able to take away from you the experiences, totally. the growth, the knowledge that you can be knocked down and be like, I've been here before. This is not that it's nothing, but I yeah. know what to do now. Yep. You know, I know that there's light at the end of the tunnel where I didn't know that before, but there is, I promise. Yeah, there is. You know, and I know that I am capable. I, I was mm. just telling my mentee the other day, I was like, once you realize that you are the bank, that's it. That that means at any moment in time, you can make a withdrawal from yourself, mm. right? But it's important that you invest in yourself in order mm. to be able to do so. You are the bank. Yeah. You, there's no external thing that you need. Nothing has to happen outside of you. No, everything is right there. And at any moment in time, you can make that withdrawal and then pour into the rest of your life. But it takes us a long time sometimes to understand that we're the bank, not our significant other, hmm. not the job, not whatever, yeah. that it's you. Hmm. It's you. And no matter wherever you go, there you are. So hmm. at, at any moment in time, you know, you have the capability of working toward turning it around. It's just so many people give up on themselves, but I wish it's absolutely, or they just say to your point, I'm unable, this isn't something I've ever known, or it's not Mm -hmm. anything I've ever done. Um, And yet the truth is this really isn't beyond any of us. It It isn't, it isn't, it's possible. And the running through the gauntlet of it, and I'm tickled right now, like thinking back on endless days that my kids walked in on me and I'm at the dining room table. I've got papers everywhere. I've got my readers on. I've got my laptop up with 10 tabs. I'm budgeting. I'm, I'm calling people like, how can I, can this be lowered? What's the, what's your mm-hmm. best deal? Like yep. um, I'm canceling subscriptions and, and they would just walk in and be like, mom, this is like a whole mood. I'm like, it is. It and is. they watched me do it for so many months. And now the sense of personal empowerment yes. is worth its weight in yep. gold. I'm just not afraid anymore. I'm like, yes. oh, every cat can be skinned. Yes. I get it. I get, this is not all unmanageable. It yes. isn't. Somebody knows what this thing is and they yes. can teach you. Yes. Somebody knows. I always, my dad would always say, so this would be the joke that he would joke. Like if I, because he was like, really, he wanted us all to always get all A's. And I remember like distinctly, like if I got like a B, he yeah. would always ask me, like, did anybody in class get an A? And I'm like, oh, yeah, Tanya got an A. Oh, so Tanya must have two heads. <laughs> and as a kid, I didn't understand. I'm like, well, I don't know what you mean. He said, no, because the only way Tanya could have gotten an A and not you is that she has two heads, therefore two brains. Mm. So she must be twice as smart, meaning if A's are being given, where's yours? Oh, your dad didn't play. Yes. And so I'll be like, well, I just, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, because he's right. And at first I used to think it's so unfair. No, what he's saying is, is to your point, Jen, there are people out there investing. Why not you? Why not you? There are people out there who have bought homes. Why not you? Right. There are people out there who are living below their means or, yeah. or who are wealthy. Like I like to drive through like really like wealthy neighborhoods and be like, Timmy, there's like 50 houses in this neighborhood. Uh-huh. 50 different people have figured out how to get this beautiful house. Why not you? 
Mm, What's so good. special? Do they have two heads? Yes. That's you know? good. And so that's good. it's a reminder that if a, another human being has been able to accomplish, it's very likely that you can as well. That's good. You know, that's so good. And so like, yeah, so it's just, I mean, for most women, I'd say it's not, um, it's not a capability issue. For no, women women, it's a confidence issue. Yes. Okay. I feel it in the air. We are coming back to life. The world is humming more and more again. It warms my soul to see us all gathering with each other again, hugging our friends and family, heading out of town, hitting up patio restaurants and everything. Of course, with the return of all this also comes the return of errands (laughs) and lots of them. Where did all those errands come from, right? But let me tell you one pesky errand I've crossed off my list forever and that's going to the post office. I've been using stamps.com actually for a few years now. Ever since my team introduced me to them, we use them to ship out all our precious Jen Hatmaker book club boxes across the country. Here's how it works. Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS right to your laptop. You can mail and ship anytime, anywhere. Letters, packages, any class of mail, you name it. When your mail's ready, just schedule a pickup or you drop it off. That's it. Not only is this convenient, you pay less, a lot less actually. With stamps.com, you get discounts of up to 40% off post office rates and up to 66% off UPS shipping rates. Stop wasting time going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with my promo code for the love, you get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. So just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in for the love. So that's stamps.com, promo code for the love, stamps.com. You guys never go to the post office again. Well, I was just going to add to that this sort of practical element, which is at least on the front end of this, while you are setting up your systems, while you are figuring out where you're at, it's a time, it takes time. I I treated this like a very, almost like a full-time job for a minute. Mm -hmm. Like it just takes time to be on that phone. It takes time to be on the, on all your accounts and getting it organized. And so I think also this idea you said earlier, easy doesn't teach us anything. Well, this isn't easy. So mm-hmm. just know that going in there, this will take time and energy. Parts of it will be frustrating. Uh, it's a it's a bit of a labor, a bit of a lift. But one thing I'm discovering now, 10 months in, is truly to a large degree, once you have your systems in place, yes. once you've got it sorted, the sorting is like, uh, mm-hmm. but once you do, a lot of it rolls. It yes. just rolls right on. It just you yep. automate it. That's and it. it's like, okay. I'm on top of this. Yeah. Like, automation is the new discipline. That's one of my things. I always say that like automation is the new discipline that once you it's, it's, it's the sifting and the sorting you're right in the beginning. Yeah. That's so overwhelming. But once you put it into their system huh? and you get that automation going, you're like, Oh, I don't really have to manage that much. Yes. I just have to check in on the systems that I've created. Yes. Exactly. I tell, like, especially if you're a mom when someone says it's so hard, I'm like, Oh, so that baby that you grew inside mm. you and mm. didn't know anything when they, when they first came. Right. So I promise you that if you gave birth to a baby and they're still alive to this day, meaning like you're feeding them, you're like, hey, I'm <laughs> here. Uh, sis, you got this budget. That's good. Because like, you know, like I, I, I always ask my mom, like, how'd you do it with five kids? She's like, I don't recommend it. I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> Which one of us don't you recommend? <laughs> I mean, like, if you can raise yeah. five, one, you have a dog, you have a yeah. cat, you look after your parents. I promise you, and that yeah. all of those responsibilities right. are way harder than how do I budget my money? That's great. It's just that it's something new because I want to, especially for women, I yeah. want to, I want to prove to them that you're already doing harder things. That's so great. You're I already, love this mindset. You know, you're already doing harder things. Like, like it's like this right here. It just seems hard because you've never done it before. That's right. But Anybody with a newborn will tell you, like, I remember my husband was telling me when um, Alyssa was born yeah. that um, he he and her mom used to wake up every two hours and wake her up to feed her. Yeah. And they were like, we were so exhausted. And then we went to the doctor. The doctor was like, you don't, you don't have to wake the baby up. <laughs> Let her <laughs> sleep. <Yeah. laughs> 
if she's hungry, babies know when they're hungry. Yes. She'll wake up and ask for, 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 for food. And yeah. they're like, wait, what? But it, they're like, no, that they said it, it's possible that a baby might want to eat every two hours, but you don't have to yeah. force her to eat every two hours. They're like, nobody told us. <laughs> and so imagine like yeah. that, that is much, much, much harder. So totally. I want to, no matter you, whoever is listening, I promise you that whatever life experiences that you've experienced, mm. it, it is much more difficult than creating a budget, creating a savings plan, automating that, even mm. investing as much as they try to make it seem like it's so difficult. Mm. So there are just some, some specific rules that you might just not know. That's why I said, that's why when I wrote, like someone asked me before, like, you know, like why get good with money? Mm. Why now? And I remember as I was working my way through so whenever I, I, um, I know a thing, I teach a thing, mm-hmm. you know, and I said, okay, so I'm learning how to do this. I'm going to teach it. And then what would happen is I would teach my audience and then I would see like, oh, look, their credit scores are raising. Awesome. Yeah. Wait, they're not budgeting. Okay. I'm going to teach you how to budget. Then everybody's budget was doing great, but wait, they're not saving yeah. or they don't have insurance. And I thought to myself, they're succeeding in silos mm. that there wasn't this holistic thread yep. And it worried me because people were, it's like the teacher in me, I felt like I had taught you your letters, but not your shapes. Hmm. I taught your shapes, but not your numbers. Hmm. And it was incomplete education. Hmm. And so when I wrote Get Good With Money, I said, I wanted a complete guide to the financial fundamentals, a hmm. complete financial guide to your financial education. It's great. So you can start from the beginning. Yep to the end and have this foundation, no matter what age you are, yeah. no matter what you make. No yeah. matter what you do for a living. And um, you would have this guide that you can refer back to. You might skip a chapter because you're like, my credit is great. And that's great. You can jump right to <laughs> investing or maybe your investing is good, but you don't have an estate plan. And mm. so I'm just, I, the teacher in me knows that my role in this life is to be of one, to be of service to others mm. and to transform people's lives through education, through mm. teaching, you know, mm. like that is, that is what I've been created for. And so, so great. So never again will somebody have to navigate by themselves through difficult times, or even if you just wanted to grow. That's yeah, so just, great. No, thank you, Jen. Because honestly, I just feel like when you, one, when you teach, you learn twice. So the more I teach, the better mm-hmm. I yeah. get. Right. And two, you know, once you're in alignment with why you've been put here, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, there's nothing stopping me. Like financial education is like, I think just one of the reasons why I was, I was placed here, like, like yeah. I said, especially for women, because we have been left out of that conversation totally. for so long. You know, it's not a coincidence that I have the dad and mom that I have, mm. that I had, you know, I went through that recession, like the way I did, because I'm able to say, oh, foreclosure, me too. Yeah. Oh, credit card debt, same. That's right. And, yeah. Um, and so I think this, it, it's to your earlier point women are already doing harder things yes. and to, with great success. They can do this too. Mm-hmm, they can exactly. do this too. And they can be incredible at it. I want to ask you one last thing before we land the plane here. Um, I just, it's so inspiring and encouraging to listen to your story, to the arc of your story. And I, I think what I appreciate most is that you've been there, mm-hmm. learned your own self, and then you put it into practice. You're trustworthy because you understand. Mm-hmm. Um, what has been for you the most I don't know what the adjective is incredible or surprising or thrilling feedback that you have received as the budgetista. Mm-hmm. Um, now having been sort of in this world for all these years, probably the best thing that I ever heard. Some of it's like, doesn't seem like a big deal, but it was to me, the feedback from, so my audience, I call them my dream catchers. And there's about a million women worldwide. Yeah. And I remember a woman saying she was having her first baby and she just assumed she was going to have to put everything on a credit card. Mm. And she was like, Tiffany, after like taking your classes and your lessons and listening to your podcast, Brown and Vision, I joined your school. I, I can pay for the things for my baby with the money I have saved for the baby. And to her, she just couldn't believe it. Like, I can't believe I have money to like, you know, and so to start this new journey and the one that probably made me boohoo the most was there was a woman who wrote me and um, she was like, "Um, I'm newly homeless. Hmm. Um, I'm writing to you. I'm messaging you from my phone, phone in a woman's shelter and I'm not unemployed, but I'm underemployed. I just don't make enough to be able to support myself and my children. And she was just like, I'm not really sure what to do. Um, Should I take, cause I have some like um, online like classes and stuff. Should I take, 
these classes and they were free. And I was like, yes. And then I also, cause Linda, my best friend, Linda is also a social worker. Mm. So I asked Linda for a bunch of like resources for her and her children. So I shared them along with her as well. Then I want to say two and a half, almost three years later, she messaged me on Facebook and said, Hey, Tiffany, I don't know if you remember me. And I did, cause I could see the message from before. And she said, I just want you to know that I'm closing on my home. And I'm like, wait, what? She went, I was like, call me. I didn't even know her. And we were both boo-hooing on the phone. She went from homeless to homeowner in about three years. And she's not the first. You know, well, she was the first, but there were many after that. And so for me, I just, Mm. I I know I want to leave a legacy behind of transformation. That's good. Yes. (laughs) Ah. Well done. All right. I want to ask you like three last kind of quick questions off the top of your head. I'm asking everybody in the transition series, these same questions. So here's the first one. Can you just tell us briefly about a, a transition in your life, either a chosen transition Mm -hmm. or one that was thrust upon you. And one thing that you learned about yourself in the process. So transition, losing my job. Mm. Um, and what I learned in the process is that, um, one that my, my, my mission was still the same. I was still a teacher, even if I wasn't teaching in the classroom, that that did not change that I'm still teacher Tiffany, but just outside of the classroom. Right. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Me too. I used to be a teacher. Mm, okay. Yeah. I taught fourth grade. And I remember one time I told my parents, thanks for that college degree. Sorry, I'm not using it. And they were like, Yes, you are. You're <laughs> still a teacher. Mm-hmm. You're just teaching different people in different subjects. Um, this is a question we ask everybody. Okay. What's saving your life right now? Uh, what's saving my life right now would be family and friends. I think if quarantine and pandemic taught us nothing, it's the importance of, you know, staying connected. Yeah. And all the accolades and things. That's cool. Cause I'm, like I found that Geek of Money is a, a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, oh, that's great. But it doesn't give me more joy than visiting my nieces and my nephew totally. and, and talking to my sister. So yeah. So yeah. connection and relationships are same. Me. Same. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being on today. Thank you for all your incredible wisdom and your time. I will link to all things, Tiffany and Bajanese to everybody. So you will be able to find her, find her book, find her work, find her classes. Um, she's a one-stop shop. Delighted to meet you. Proud Thank of you. you. Jen. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Everything Tiffany just said is a compilation of everything I've learned in 10 months. She just laid it out like one step after another. And I love this for you run to get her book. Um, We'll link to everything guys. Well, if you go over to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, we have all the show notes um, from this particular episode, which is pretty meaty. That's a really good resource for you. Um, so don't forget to use that. And then over there, we'll link, we'll link to all of her socials. We'll link to her website, her book. So you can just find it all in one place at jenhatmaker.com. Um, it's really exciting and empowering for me to hear your financial independence stories. So thank you for sharing those. Um, for sharing what you're learning, for sharing what you are tackling. I'd love to be a part of this like shame busting community around financial conversations. I really appreciated how much she dialed into that idea Um, because money is such a source of fear and shame and it doesn't have to be. It just doesn't have to be. And so Thanks for being here. I love this. Um, I love this transitions series. So many of us are in flux and being in flux is not bad. Sometimes that means we are transitioning from good to great. Right. Um, and so I hope that this was one episode that helped you really go. It's time. It's time. I can do this. I am capable. And this is, this is the this is the moment. So thanks for being here and sure do love serving you in this, with this podcast. So Laura and her team and Amanda and I are always just grateful to, to bring this to you a week in and week out. You guys have a great week and I'll see you next time.